I was tempted to just preach on Vacation Bible School, but I think I'm going to start our next series today instead. And, and just to sort of set things up, I want to ask you guys, just by way of show of hands, and I'm not fishing for anything in particular, I'm not going to go put black marks in the directory or anything like that, but how many of you here today have read through the book of Judges sometime in the last month? Anybody? Okay. All right. How many of you have read through the book of Judges, say, in the last year? Okay, a few more hands. How many of you here today, and again, this is, I'm not fishing for anything, but how many of you have, have never read through the book of Judges? Anybody here? Okay, handful of hands have never read through the book of Judges. You know, I will admit readily that the book of Judges is a very troubling book to read through. And many of the things that the people of Israel face during the time of the judges is not something that many of us face today in many ways. And we may struggle with how in the world to apply the things that we read there to our lives. And our understanding of, of judges can be limited because of that. And therefore, we may be tempted to disregard this Old Testament book, to, to not read it, to not pay it much mind. However, with that said, I, I do need to say that God included it in the Bible for a reason. And it speaks to us today if we take the time to study it and look for application. Remember, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so today, I'm going to actually start a five-part series on the book of Judges. And today we're simply going to have an introductory message to the book, and then we're going to take the next four weeks to look at the lives of four individual judges, is what I'm going to do with this. I'm not going to preach through this verse by verse as I do with some things. Five messages, introduction today, and then we're going to look at four individual judges in four consecutive weeks. And so with that said, with that just basic introduction, I want to dive right in to this book. And if you haven't already, you can open up to Judges. It's in the Old Testament right after Joshua. And um, you'll find it there. And the book of Judges, it is a very interesting book with some very famous accounts of Bible characters. I mean, many of you who have grown up in the church, if you've gone to Sunday school or VBS or things like that, you've probably heard of people like Samson and Gideon and Deborah. These are all people that are contained in this book. Judges also contains, I'll let you know straight out, some very shocking accounts of horrific sin. And that's part of the reason why I'm not preaching through this verse by verse. There are some sinful acts and accounts in Judges that are shocking to read and graphic in detail. Some of you are going to be running home and reading the book of Judges. <laughs> Now, while we're not going to go through the entire book, like I said, we're not going to go through it verse by verse, I, I do encourage you, in, in all honesty now, and, and with joking aside, I do encourage you to read through the book of Judges and let the seriousness of sin speak to your heart and mind. As you read through that, let that sort of soak in as you take in all that was going on in the nation of Israel during the time of the Judges. As a whole, the book of Judges, it chronicles a very dark time in the history of Israel that occurred very soon after the golden years of the Joshua generation. And we know a lot of the Joshua stories, I mean, all the miraculous things that Israel is doing as they were entering into the land. I mean, after all of the great conquests and blessings of God that Israel experienced under the leadership of Joshua, Israel then spiraled down into horrendous sin. Judges is not the kind of reading that we do for pure enjoyment. But it is an important era in the history of Israel and an era that we need to understand and from which we can actually draw some very important lessons for us today. Now, as mentioned, much of the book of Judges highlights the depths to which Israel fell into sin. And much of the book's treatment of sin is very graphic and shocking in description, but it serves to let the reader know just how far Israel had fallen. And sad to say, while many of the accounts are extremely troubling to read, 
It is an era that is very similar to the days in which we live. Just read the paper or watch the news. Making it a message that is all the more pertinent, I think, to us today. And we would do well to listen carefully and heed the message God has for us in these difficult pages. Now, because it is a fact that disobedience almost always grows more serious when left unchecked. That you can be assured of. However, the other thing that we need to see, and, and you do see throughout the book of Judges, is that despite Israel's continual disobedience, God does not forget them. God does not forget Israel. He raises up a series of judges and delivers them from their oppression. By and large, these judges, as they're called, were heroic conquerors who delivered Israel from physical oppression, military campaigns. They did not level any kind of judgment like we would think of a judge today. Sometimes the word can be a little confusing. You know, you can think of these judges, Samson and Gideon and Deborah, more in the line of like Generals Douglas MacArthur or Norrin Schwarzkopf. These judges often displayed a measure of faith, and they were raised up by God and empowered by His Spirit. However, with that said, they also display flaws and sin in their own life and really did not contribute at all to improving the spiritual condition of Israel. They simply saved them from a dire time. But despite their flaws, the judges often acted heroically. They, they had heroic feats, and the book of Judges does not exaggerate or romanticize their exploits, but rather it shows how God used flawed individuals to carry out his purposes during a very dark time in the nation of Israel's history, and I would submit he does so still today. So with all of that said this morning, I want to just take a few moments and walk you through the first two chapters of this book with some commentary along the way, and then draw four points of application. That's what we're going to do this morning. Just go through the first two chapters. I'll pause periodically for some comments, give you four points of application. So if you have not done so already, I invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Judges, and just follow along as I read through chapter 1, verses 1 through 26 to start. Judges chapter 1, verses 1 through 26. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who will be the first to go up and fight for us against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah is to go. I have given the land into their hands. Then the men of Judah said to the Simeonites, their brothers, come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We in turn will go with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men of Bezek. It was there that they found Adonai Bezek and fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Then Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem also and took it. They put the city to the sword and set it on fire. After that, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev and the western foothills. They advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron, formerly called Kiriath Arba, and defeated Sheshai, Halman, and Talmai. From there they advanced against the people living in Deber, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter... Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sephir. Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. One day when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, What can I do for you? She replied, Do me a special favor, since you have given me land in the Negev. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. The descendants of Moses' father-in-law, the Kenite went up from the city of, of Palms with the men of Judah to live among the people of the desert of Judah in the Negev near Arad. Then the men of Judah went with Simeonites, their brothers, and attacked the Canaanites living in Zephath. And they totally destroyed the city. Therefore it was called Hormah. The men of Judah also took Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron, each city with its territory. 
The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had iron chariots. As Moses had promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, who drove from it the three sons of Anak. The Benjaminites, however, failed to dislodge the Jebusites, who were living in Jerusalem. To this day, the Jebusites lived there with the Benjamites. Now the house of Joseph attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. When they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spies saw a man coming out to the city and said to him, Show us how to get into the city, and we'll see that you are treated well. So he showed them and put the city to the sword, but spared the man and his whole family. He then went to the land of the Hittites, where he built a city called Luz, which is its name to this day. So in these verses, we see Israel continuing to go into the land that God had given them through a series of military campaigns and conquests. And I know that some of these names are strange to us. It may not make a whole lot of sense or mean much to us. But there are a few things that are important to the story that are contained in these verses. Very crucial, actually. You see, while we're reading about these military campaigns and conquests, you must understand they are only partial victory. You have to keep that in mind. This is partial victory, not full victory. We see in verse 19, Judah could not drive out the inhabitants of the plains because of their iron chariots, it says. We see in verse 21 that Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. This is a problem. It's a big problem. God had instructed the Israelites in multiple places. You can go back to Joshua chapters 6 and 11, for example, that they were to drive out the inhabitants completely. Not partially. Completely. And so with this in mind, then, I want you to listen to the rest of chapter 1, beginning in verse 27. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Beth Shan, or Tanakh, or Dor, or Iblium, or Megiddo, and their surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer. But the Canaanites continued to live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nehel, who remained among them. But they did subject them to forced labor. Nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko or Sidon or Alam or Agzib or Helba or Aphek or Rahab. And because of this, the people of Asher lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Bet Shemesh or Bet Anath. But the Naphtalites, they too lived among the Canaanites inhabited of the land. And those living in Bet Shemesh and Bet Anath became forced laborers for them. The Amorites conf confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. And the Amorites were determined also to hold on out in Mount Harris, Algelon, and Shalabim. But when the power of the house of Joseph increased, they too were pressed into forced labor. The boundary of the Amorites was from Scorpion Pass to Sela and beyond. So here in these verses, we see a series of similar statements where the Israelites did not drive out the inhabitants completely. And again, while this may be hard for us to understand, you think, well, what's the big deal? Given the time and the place in which we live, you have to understand that failure to do this was in direct violation to what the Lord required. They are in outright sin by not doing this. Sure, they subjected the inhabitants of the land into forced labor, but that is not what God said to do in any way, shape, or form. So what we have going on here is incomplete obedience and coexistence with the enemy. That's what you have. Incomplete obedience and coexistence with the enemy, and both are recipes for disaster. In fact, listen to the response of the Lord in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your forefathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? 
Now therefore I tell you that I will not drive them out before you. They will be thorns in your side, and their gods will be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bochum. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of their inheritance at Timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. God had explicitly commanded Israel to not make covenants with pagan nations and to tear down their altars in Exodus and Deuteronomy. You can go back and read that over and over. And so the angel of the Lord, he comes and he calls Israel out for their blatant disobedience here. And the root of Israel's sinful ways is in view for all to see through that angel's statement. They are unwilling to make a complete break from the sinful world around them. That's the root of their sin. That's their problem. They are unwilling to break completely from the worldly sin around them. The people, then they're remorseful about their sin, and they try to appease God through sacrifices. But it was short-lived, as we see in verse 10. Because of Israel's unwillingness to make a clean and complete break with the world around them, an entire generation rose up who did not even know God. Think of families who are unwilling to break from sin and the next generation of children that raise up don't even know God. You see how it works? And we read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Cry out all you want in remorse, but if you're not going to obey, what's the point? Show up to church on Sundays, raise your hand at the right time, clap at the right time, but if you go home and don't obey, what's the point? You're going to raise up a generation of people that don't even know God is what you're going to do. You reap what you sow. I'll also mention, because it can be a little confusing, verses 6 through 9, that's just a revisitation of the fact that Joshua had died. It's not that all of a sudden he's back on the scene. And the people did not have a good, strong, godly leader. And they fell away. As we continue in the text then, we see the details of Israel's sin and their complete corruption that has resulted from their failures. Listen to 11 through 15. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. These are the gods, the pagan gods. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them up out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtaroths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord handed them over to raiders who plundered them. He sold them to their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. And they were in great distress. You see, the people then completely abandoned God and followed pagan practices. The people just completely walked away from God and followed the world around them. They just did things like the world. And this is a complete and utter disregard for God's commands and what he wants for his children. And God was angered over this, and we read that his hand was against the people of Israel. They did not experience success in the things that they tried to do, and they were plundered by enemies to the point they were in great distress. However, in spite of all this, God still has compassion on his people. Listen to the rest of chapter 2. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with that judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways, even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. 
Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, Because this nation has violated the covenant that I laid down with their forefathers and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in, in it as their forefathers did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. And so even though Israel walked blatantly in their sin, they thumbed their nose at God. God raised up judges to deliver them from their oppression. Boy, what a crazy start to the book of Judges. And we may feel bad for the people of Israel on many levels, but what in the world does this have to do with anything that we face today? Well, I feel it has a lot to do with us today. And I'd like to just draw four points of application with the time that we have left this morning. And the first point is simply this, and we see it in the book. Sin comes quickly and deceitfully. This is a point of application we would do well to listen to and take to heart. Sin comes quickly and deceitfully. Israel was moving into land, which is good. That's a good thing. But they were not following the Lord completely, which led to their downfall. They were engaging in sin and did not even know it. We just finished a study, a sermon series on spirit-led living and the process of sanctification being made holy, which can often be slow and painful. We talked about how it takes a lifetime to become like Jesus. But the reverse process, falling into sin, can happen like that. In fact, so quickly, you may not even know it. As you are living in this fallen world, and we all are, you will be faced with all kinds of temptations that when engaged will pull you down quickly and deceitfully. You must realize how quickly and deceitfully sin can come and avoid it at all costs. Do not think for a moment that you are unlike the nation of Israel. The next point of application that surfaces as we read the text is simply this. Sin comes when we limit our obedience to what we deem possible. Sin comes when we limit our obedience to what we deem possible. Let me explain this for a moment. We saw in the text that Israel tried to drive the Canaanites out. But they had chariots of iron. There's no way we can drive them out, right? I guess Israel had forgotten the amazing deliverance of God with the walls of Jericho. You remember that? Or what about crossing through the Red Sea as they left Egypt? You remember that? I think Israel's sort of forgotten these things. Israel limited their obedience, going forth with what God told them to do, complete conquest of the land, because they did not think it was possible for them to overcome the Canaanites. They have chariots of iron, by the way. And this allowed sin to overtake them. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. Maybe you feel like you will never have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse like everyone else. You know that God calls you to become involved only with other strong, committed believers. But the only people who are paying you any attention are non-believers. And so you give in. And you fail to obey because you do not see any possibility of a committed Christian coming your way. And so you settle. You don't obey completely. You sin. Maybe you do not see any possibility of your marriage relationship being restored and repaired. And I'm talking about not biblical reasons for divorce, but it's just hard and you don't see any way of it being fixed. And, and so rather than trust God, you divorce. 
Maybe you do not see any possibility of your finances getting better, so you are unethical at work. Fudge a little here, fudge a little there. God, let me help you out. Fill in the blank. You see how it works? You limit your obedience to the Lord by what you deem possible. And you invite sin through the front door, right in. You invite sin right through the front door of your heart. And you give it a place to sit down and stay. Remember, all things are possible with God. No matter what you may see. The next point of application is that you know right from wrong by listening to the Lord. If you want to know what's right or wrong, listen to God. You know right from wrong by listening to the Lord. Later on in Judges chapter 17, 6, and in 21, 25, we read, In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. That really was the problem. Israel simply did whatever they thought was best without any regard towards the Lord and what he would have for them. Israel failed to listen to God, and it got them into all kinds of trouble. And this is true for all people. Every single one of us. When we fail to listen to the Lord, we get into all kinds of trouble. In Jeremiah 17, 9, we read, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The world says, Listen to your hearts. I don't know what I should do. Oh, listen to your heart. What's your heart telling you? Don't do that. That's a horrible thing to listen to. We just read the heart's deceitful and beyond cure. It will lead you into sin. And since you cannot tell right from wrong by listening to your own good judgment, you need a different source. And that's the Lord. You tell right from wrong by listening to the Lord. Well, how do you listen to the Lord? Well, you do that through prayer and reading His Word. You know, we say here at this church, it's down on one of the posters in the fellowship hall, that knowing and obeying God's Word is fundamental to all true success, and we fully believe that. Read God's Word on a regular basis. Talk to Him in prayer. Listen to what He says, and you will be able to tell right from wrong and stand firm against sin. And the last point of application that we see in the text this morning is simply this. God's work in us is not based on perfection. God's work in us is not based on our perfection. Human beings' obedience is never perfect. Now that may seem a little strange at first. We do not have the capacity to obey God perfectly. We saw that in our text today. Israel did not obey perfectly, and it led to disastrous consequences. But even so, God loved them. And He provided ways out for them through the deliverance at the hands of the judges. Yes, the victory of the Israelites over the Canaanites required faith, it required obedience, but in the end, the fulfillment of God's promises and purposes is God's work, not ours. And it's based on God's faithfulness and God's power. Also, as we continue to look at some of these individual judges over the coming weeks, we will see that God used flawed instruments to achieve his purposes, and he still does that today. Understand, nothing has changed. We need to be aware of the wiles of sin and the importance of standing against it through obedience and trust in the Lord, but I want to let you in on something today. You will not obey perfectly. This does not mean that we don't continue to strive and to grow. Yes, we do. But realize that God's work in us is not based on our perfection. That is so crucial to living the Christian life. God's work in us is not based on our perfection because we can't achieve it. God's work in us is based on God. 
and what he does, his faithfulness, his power. It's based on his love, his mercy, and his faithfulness to bring it all to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 1.6. And praise God for that. Wow. I guess there's quite a bit here in the book after all. We read those opening chapters with all these strange names and strange places, and we think, uh, but we, boy, when you dig in, there's so much there that speaks to us today. And while the situations that Israel faced may not be the same things that we face in 2015 Cheyenne, Wyoming, I know we don't go out the door and face the Jebusites and the Canaanites and see iron chariots. I understand that. But there's a lot that we can take away. In some ways, if you insert all, if you take all those names of those, those you know, different lands and peoples and just put sin in there, I think you've got a grasp on what Judges is talking about. And I pray that as you go home and you start your week, that you're just a little more aware of sin's power and deceitfulness and the need for us to stand firm in complete obedience and eradicate it, drive it out completely. However, I also hope you understand a little more fully God's mercy and grace and the need that we have for Him if we want to withstand sin and drive it out of our lives. And next week, I hope that you come excited to take a look at one of the great judges from Israel's past, Deborah. That's who we're going to start with. We're going to look at Deborah next week and see what we can learn from her life. And if you want to read ahead, she's in chapters 4 and 5 of Judges. And I'm looking forward to, to hearing what God would teach us through the life of the judge, Deborah. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. And again, it's a word, a book that maybe we don't spend a ton of time in, haven't read for a long time, if ever. But there's a lot there. And Lord, I pray that here over the coming four weeks, as we look at some different judges, that we could glean some things that we could apply to our lives, that we may be more like you. And Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, that you would go before us and help us to drive sin out of our lives, to separate from a sinful world in a way that's completely obedient to you and allows you full reign of our hearts and our minds, that we may serve you well.